So, Danielle, question for you. This is from Bill online. Um, he said, how have you found success connecting the user and business value of consistency in voice, tone and style, terminology, reusable strings, etc.? How has that helped you build a coalition for investing in AI for content design? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so <clears throat> honestly, like having those allies, right? Um, in like the design org, I had a big ally in like um, the, what do we call it? DPMs and um, design ops in the world. And so, yeah, just like literally just being like, hey, <laughs> you know, having showing the consistency and like doing an audit of a before and after and something that I haven't yet to, gotten to explore, um, but that is possible is that um, with like Writer AI, our rep can build out like this kind of like R ROI tool that shows like value from a real data perspective because they have all these analytics dashboards that even I don't really understand to a certain extent. But yeah, it's really just doing like the before and after. That's why I, I said um, measuring success, knowing what you're measuring at the beginning really helps have that North Star and then it just makes it easy to kind of close the loop on those conversations of like, this is the value that we're gonna show and this is how we're gonna show it. Um, and then something that we didn't do at Twitter that I've been playing around with, that I've been working towards doing at uh, Pinterest um, is like just creating a pilot program and having, uh, you know, whether it's like on growth or something, something that's really measurable to um, really show that value. So again, like, you know, I, it's not one size fits all. I'm still exploring myself, but that's kind of the ways that um, I've been able to have the conversations about value and prove value, yeah. Great. Thank you. And we had another question actually um, around how do you handle the maintenance for the AI tools you're using? Uh, yeah, that one's really hard. And, you know, honestly, like sometimes it's like an obstacle. Um, at one company, right, we had Writer AI and um, then we had layoffs, right? And it was just like it wasn't possible for us to do the work to interplay AI. At that point, it was just not helpful. That was not the thing to focus on. Um, at, at Twitter, we had a really interesting group of content designers who really wanted to do the work of maintenance. You know, they, they saw the value of how it would help them align with their stakeholders in their area, of course, oh no, <laughs> um, and everything. But yeah, I think just like dividing those roles and responsibilities early and like having those processes set up, you know, kind of like, okay, this is how we're going to approach terminology. This is kind of our cadence for review. This is how we're going to do it, that approach, like documenting that, like to me, that goes a long way as opposed to just kind of like being like, oh no, what do we do? You know? Um, but again, sometimes you can't anticipate everything, but if you can just like lay out a little bit of process um, and, and make it clear that that can help provide some guidance into how to keep it going. But again, work in progress. It's not going to be perfect. So yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, question for Nicole. Um, how do you measure the impact of your content design team? Um, is, this is from Shamili and she says, measuring impact is something being asked about by leadership a lot. Yeah, I think, I think it's a really good question. And I feel like the content design community got a little bit stuck in trying to really figure out the metrics and how do we best show impact. And I think it's one of the reasons why we've been quite focused on microcopy. So what I try to do, and again, it goes a little bit back to what I said about getting content design as part of the quality assurance process, because you can really like label through based on like, we have level one, which is there's no content design. It's not even at baseline. We have level two, there's a baseline of content design. That means this, this, and this. We have level three. That means that a content designer was involved at some point. That means this, this, and this. Then we have a level four, which is where I think all companies want to get at. It's that some companies call it delight. Um, at order, we call it vault grade. Um, that's like top tier. Uh, for content design, this means content design was a full-fledged partner on this, and it means you can look out for these things, and those things will be measurable in the end result, in the end product that we released based on all kinds of metrics that we allocate. It's one of those benefits as well. If you're involved in those high stakes projects, the metrics that you're looking at are clear from the beginning before you even start any kind of design process. So you can really make sure that you content design for impact on those metrics. So you don't really have to set up your own. It's all tied together. And I think that works really, really well. Yeah, and I think um, to your point about like having the kind of fully fledged 
te like the teams with fully fledged content designers. Kylie Henson did a study at Microsoft, which is worth looking up. Who ever asked this question? I can't remember who it was now. And um, they like showed the difference in things like NPS and usability scores for the teams that did have fully embedded content design. And like it's a really compelling argument for having content design. So yeah, just add to that one. Uh, Mary, I've got a question for you here from Anna. What is the one thing we can do to make the tempo community here in the room stronger? <laughs> I think, I, I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, I think, I think this community is pretty strong. It's like when you go into Slack and you see like how everybody's trying to help out each other, it's mm -hmm. brilliant. I think it's, it's more on us on trying to like bring what are the problems that we're struggling with rather than try to expect the community to give you the information because like the community is a whole bunch of people, right? So benefit of like this hive mind type of type of thing. And like when you have, when you're struggling, it doesn't matter if it's like a very work related, very tactical or technical thing of like, how do you want to set up your team? Or like, how do you want to bring AI into the mix? That has room for it, but it also has room with like, you know what, I'm struggling with this thing. Has anybody ever had this problem? And you'll find that you might not find the one-to-one -one solution, but you'll be able to pick stuff from different of those answers and trying to build something that works for you, right? That's, that's the beauty of communities, right? Having a different perspective that will help you out, but you still have to do that work to bring that closer to home. Yeah. I think there's, there's always someone who's going through the thing, the challenge that you're, that you're going through. So yeah, just lean on, I would just say, just lean on each other. Yeah, it's like, we're not the only ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, a question for Danielle. How do you avoid or handle having to maintain guidelines in multiple places, um, for example, in your AI tool and then maybe somewhere else, like on your design system site? Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> um, so I try to simplify it as much as possible. I think having it in multiple places, just like... It just, I don't know, maybe other people have other experiences, but it just, it, it, it makes it too complicated. Um, so if you have your guidelines already embedded in your design system, um, I think keep it there. <laughs> don't like put it in, you know, uh, a third party source, another thing that other people have to learn. But, you know, there are some teams I've been on where we didn't have it anywhere. So it was like, okay, this is going to be the source of truth. But having to maintain it and update it, it's just like, it, it, I don't know, it just never works out for me, at least, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Um, not a question, but an East London taco recommendation for Mario. <laughs> Homies on donkeys. There you go, you need Got to it. set that one up. Thank you. Um, okay, question for Nicole. Um, you shared a screenshot with your sheet titled Content Design Principles. Sorry if, the, if I missed this, but who's the primary audience and when and how do they use it? So the content design principles is essentially the baseline of all of the content design we do. But this specific screenshot was from our QA review spreadsheet where basically content design is just one tab of it. And then there's a tab for design, there's a tab for data, there's a tab for accessibility. Um, and the content design principles are basically broken down into more specific questions that anyone in the company that has worked on the product should be able to answer. So it's written in a way that an engineer understands what it is and it's linked to resources. So for example, the ones that are around tone and voice will link to that part of the design system or those guidelines based on where you have that. Um, so the audience really is anyone in the product org. Um, yeah, I think that answers it, right? Great, yeah, thank you. Um, this one I'm gonna ask all of you actually, it's for Danielle, but I'm gonna ask all of you because I think it's actually a quite interesting question. Do you think the skill set of a content designer will grow and evolve, particularly with the use of AI? What will companies look for in a content designer? Um, will that change too? <laughs> um, honestly, <laughs> I, I think like AI is just a supplemental tool. I think our critical thinking skills, our ability to relationship manage, um, our ability to do that high level like strategy ecosystem work. Again, you know, that is not something this tool can replicate. So I think those things are always, you know, we value that in ourselves, And I think, you know, that's what we bring to the table. But i um, definitely interested to hear what y'all say because you are more senior and have been more managers than I am. But that, that's my perspective, yeah. Um, I think it, what, we never stop to think is like the programming language for this tool is language and hey ho we're the best in the house to actually do that programming right so if you haven't start tinkering with the tool start figuring out how it works 
try to break it and see where it breaks just to just so you understand what is actually under the hood i'm not saying that you should like look into python or anything if you if you can and want to definitely go for it but at least try to take it for a spin take it for a ride and see how you can actually make it work for you because I'm, i agree with what you were saying is like this tool is to like get the basics off our way so we can actually like you were saying they'll like get into like bigger chunkier meteor things right and let's face it it's always going to be easier to edit 10 different push notifications than writing them from scratch. So like make the tool work for you. Yeah. And I, I agree with both of these takes. And then my view is that content designers in a way, and you're going to hate me for saying this, but I think <laughs> we're always somewhat personality hires. I think content designers that are really successful in their careers, they have that kind of confidence maybe it's humor maybe it's something else i thought about this a lot while you were giving your talk there's something there when you speak and you make your points that i can see people in the room going like yeah like <laughs> this is great i maybe haven't thought about communities lately but it made a lot of sense and to really get that buy-in from people and get people excited about something that sorry most of them think they can do themselves so you really need to have that authority and you need to build that confidence i'm so sad that today we still talked about this so much that Oftentimes we feel like frauds and we feel like someone will just one day wake up and realize, what am I paying these people for? To do like content design? I don't even know what that is. And it makes me so, so sad because we add so much value to the design practice as a whole and to the company as a whole that goes beyond what we're actually called, content designers, UX writers, no matter what that is. So for me, my top advice I give anyone that asks me this question is, try to get that confidence try to get that excitement out there into the room even if you don't feel it like honestly don't feel it a lot pretty tiring at times but if you can take it with a little bit of humor if you can find ways to recharge i think communities again are a great way to do that or your ai tool because you don't have to bother with all those small requests you can focus on more high level projects which also are great because you get to grow your skills beyond what you can currently grow uh, currently do I think that's what it is for me. So I think really evolving content design into a role that you want it to be, because I think that's the one benefit we have. Mm -hmm. Product design roles are very defined. User research roles are very defined. Content design, we can still refine it, and we can keep doing that over and over again if we own it. And, and, and you know what? On top of that, it's like reach. You don't have to have a community for this. Like reach out to your friends. Like sometimes, like you might be good at picking yourself up and dusting yourself off, but sometimes you need someone else to see it from another angle to say like, hey, you got this, come on, like, get that hype person in your life, we all have one. And if you don't want, if you don't have one, like, get one. Like, you have Candy right here, she's the best hype person <laughs> ever. Ever have a uh, bad day, just like, WhatsApp Candy. Like, no, don't WhatsApp Candy. <laughs> but that's what I mean, it's like, get that hype person that will get you up, because like, we're human, it's like, we're not gonna be 100%. But this community is so generous. I'm, I'm sure if you reach out to any of, of us, it's like, we'll be there. We'll be there. We, we got your back. Yeah. And I also love, just to finish this, I think you said it yesterday, right? You started saying to your team, um, it's just PDFs, yes. like yes. at the end. Like <laughs> most of us are not saving lives yes. on a day-to-day -day basis. My, my partner, when I get really, really like involved <laughs> in some workplace stuff, some projects, like some other issues, politics, whatever it is, he just says, Nicole, like, I just heard you when we both work from home, discuss a button <laughs> for 45 minutes with 13 stakeholders. How seriously can you possibly take it? Just be glad you get to collect this huge paycheck and shut the fuck up. And honestly, he's right. He's, he's a great husband. Um, it really helps. So also get people that like take that seriousness out of it. I think it really, really helps, especially when you're going through rough times, big workload and things like that. Definitely, I would agree with that. Uh, Nick, I was sticking with you, I've got a question on office hours. Do you have any tips for office hours? Sometimes it feels like reducing content design to checking the words someone has put in a box. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Listen, I have like a very love-hate relationship with office hours. <laughs> I think you can be really lucky and get people excited about it and set them up in a way um, that you can run them efficiently and it's also fun. But they can also feel exactly like what you're describing. People are just coming in and trying to get quick resolutions for things that actually you would need time, sometimes days, to think about. Um, so there's two things that I've recently adjusted 
uh, in an office hour setup that I think really helps. Number one is really make sure if it is at all possible for you, if you're not a lone fighter, to have several content designers in those office hours. Mm -hmm. If you can, get a user researcher in there with you. If you can, get a designer in there with you every now and then, just so you can actually make it more a discussion and more like, okay, we're discussing this, we're ideating here together, rather than it just being like, oh, like I want you to rewrite this copy for me, or I need quick copy for the flow. So take the expectation away from, we want a quick fix, we're gonna quick fix your UX writing or your content design problems. It's more like a collaborative effort to get that designer or engineer who's bringing something there to think and self-serve themselves and then you know have all your resources linked or whatever. That's how I've been approaching it and it's been really successful. People show up a lot. We usually can't cover the amount of people that come during that time. Um, so if you're able to do something like that, I think it can be worth trying that out. Great, thank you. Um, question for Danielle from Gladys. I've used Writer in the past. Do you have an example of elements to create a template? Of elements to create a oh, template? Yeah, I, don't, I think I've read that right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, honestly, like uh, they have this tool kind of called like snippets, mm -hmm. um, which you can use to kind of upload repeatable cup. Uh, copy string. So um, I was working in trust and safety um, at Twitter, and there was just like, especially when it came to telling someone bad news, we had like some con co copy strings that we had tested that really went well, and you could just like plug it in um, to set the template. But like all of that was done in a kind of like playbook format and uploaded into Writer um, via like a spreadsheet or what have you. Um, and then yeah, in terms of you know. It's just like uploading the style guide, all that. I mean, that's kind of like the template. I don't know how else to <laughs> answer. Uh, Gladys, if you've got a more specific question, I can't see you, but grab, maybe grab Danielle in the break. I'm sure she'll be able to help you. Actually, Danielle, I've got another question here for yeah. you, which is a good one. Should content designers be afraid of AI? <laughs> nah, <laughs> I don't think so. I've played around with AI, and um, you know, I think we're, we're, I think we're safer. You know, I don't know, like, especially if you have just like, oh man, I remember I had, um, I was just, I was covering like five teams, and one of my product designers was just like, hey, what if I, you know, like just brought this, uh, it was like a announcement modal kind of copy, and like plug it in, and like. You know, without like having a writer doing the parameters and everything, it's it was trash. Honestly, it was just it was trash writing. It was like said a lot without saying anything at all. Um, so I think we, you know what Mario said. Like the power that we have is that we own language and know language. You know, a lot of you know you have engineers, designers putting all these inputs into into Chat GPT, but like it, it takes a true understanding of language to really make the tool effective. And I think that's where you know our power can like really shine. Yeah. I think if I can just add to, to that, one thing that I've definitely also felt a lot is that a lot of these shareholder backed big product companies, they're really using AI right now as a keyword to drive their growth. So they talk a lot about like, oh, we're using AI and then we're just not backfilling people that leave. There's a big company, Sweden Klarna, that has been talking about this a lot recently. It really grinds my gears um, because there's no proof behind this. It's just one of the things that is happening right now and it's the way that shareholder investment is driven now. And there will be a new phase again, yep. probably the phase where we scale back in that and we're like, okay, actually like all of this content feels and looks the same. It doesn't feel personal. And it will probably swing a little bit more in the other direction and they'll shift their narratives. So I think whenever you feel scared about AI, just ask yourself who owns this narrative and why. Mm. And usually it can tie back to something that calms you down a little bit. At least that's how I feel. Great. Right. I've got one more question. So I'm going to ask this to all of you as well um, before we go to the break. What if your company doesn't prioritize well or at all? How can you prioritize content to the design for those priority projects if your directors say everything is a priority? Yeah, well, when everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. Yep. So, I mean, um, there's this great book, uh, Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. He has this thing where he calls popsicle sticks. And it's basically a little bit of like we were talking today, right? So like these are the amount of projects that we have to do. As a content practitioner, as a content leader, as a content manager, these are the ones that I consider that we should have folks in it. Whatever happens to the rest is like we need to figure it out. But like the reality is we can't. 
tackle everything. So something's got to give. So it's it's a lot of like having having these conversations with the holders of stake. <laughs> Sorry, button reference um, with the stakeholders and or, or SLT or whoever you need to speak to to figure out and come to that agreement, right? So, okay, if you want me to work on this, this is fine. We'll do this. But then all these things won't have the attention or the love that we'll have. Or I think this is it. Let's try to figure out together. Because I think the keyword is there, right? Like trying to figure out together, which makes sense because they have, or they might have um, the information from the business perspective that you might have or might not, but you have like the content expertise, right? So let, if we bring those together, that should give you a much clearer roadmap or where it has to go. But the reality is like, you can't prioritize everything. I think it's exactly that. Like you, you need to manage up. I even feel in companies where they have clear priorities, you need to manage up because you're the only one that can assess if there should be a content design priority based on what the needs are, what the metrics are, what the scope is. Um, so I think it's really about trying to take ownership in that and then just saying, hey, like I think I should be on this. I don't think I should be on this. Um, that has worked well for me in the past. I think if you're in a place that doesn't respect that and still says you should do everything, I, I know it's, it's a shitty thing to say in this economy, but you should probably leave. I mean, it's probably not a great environment for you to be in in the long run. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, that's something I've, I've been in companies where, you know, the priorities change on a monthly basis, depending on the CEO's whims, right? Um, and so like, I've just had to be in constant communication um, with PMs and DPMs and designers and being like, okay, what kind of like try to get the lay of the land, what is actually happening? <laughs> and like, what are we actually working towards? Um, and, and starting from there. But yeah, sometimes there have been places where it's just you, the expectations are too much. And yeah, you do have to, you do have to like say, should I stay, should I go? Sometimes you gotta go, like Nicole said. Um, so yeah, I think um, when it comes to priorities and you know, all that ambiguity is just, being proactive about getting clear, getting that alignment, because um, sometimes, like, a lot of times, people aren't going to do that for you. Yeah, I think you know, one thing I would add to that as well is don't be afraid to let stuff go out the door without a content designer on it, because people will soon realise how bad the content was, and you, we kind of, it's really there's a real tendency to be like, no, it's got our name on it, we can't let it go out, but sometimes you just got to do it. Yeah, just got to say no. <laughs> Um, can I just ask you to give our speakers another round of applause before we go forward? Thank you so much. Um, thank you for all your questions. We're going to take a quick break now. Sorry, we're going to yeah, add something. Can we get Rachel a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.